Hello, everyone, and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 11th online reading event, the Parent Teacher Conference Edition. My name is Tom Snarsky, and I'm happy to be the MC of tonight's reading. As social distancing measures continue widely and we settle into our weekly performance anxiety schedule for as long as we can maintain it, parents and teachers everywhere are adapting to this unprecedented situation at the breakneck pace necessitated by the way our children and students engage with the world. These teachers, parents, caregivers, and all are an important part of the bedroom keeping the world spinning on its axis for their kiddos. And tonight is all about celebrating them, hearing their poems, and hearing poems about them. Uh, we're really thankful for their work and so glad that they could carve out the time to join us tonight. Uh, in case you haven't listened in before, Performance Anxiety is an online reading series hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. For now, we're working on a weekly schedule, so our next reading will actually be next Thursday. So if you're a poet or writer who'd be interested in sharing your work at a future event, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us via the Performance Anxiety Twitter account, that's at Performance A-N-X-T, because the other ones were taken, or by messaging the co-organizers directly. I'm at Tom Snarsky, uh, T-O-N. M-S-N-A-R-S-K-Y on Twitter and Instagram, or you can email me at tomsnarski at gmail.com. You're also welcome to get in touch with Kristen Garth, the other co-organizer of the series, and I'll let you know how when she shares her poems with us very soon. At each of our events, we usually share uh, feature around 10 readers who each have about five minutes or so to share a selection of their writing with us. We have folks reading live in the Skype call and in the spirit of the name performance anxiety, sometimes also our readers choose to share their work via other pre-recorded means, but we are very happy for the first time in a while to have all live readers with us this evening. So my job as MC is very easy and I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'm very, very excited to introduce to you our first reader of the evening, uh, Devin Kelly. Devin Kelly is the author of In This Quiet Church of Night, I Say Amen from Civil Coping Mechanisms. He's also the winner of a Best of the Net prize, and his writing has appeared or is forthcoming in Long Reads, The Guardian, Lit Hub, Catapult, Diagram, Redivider, and more. He lives and teaches high school in New York City. Uh, I've been privileged to see Devin read his poems live many times, and I'm very excited to get to hear them tonight. Thank you so much, Devin, for being with us. Take it away, and I can't wait to hear these. Cool. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm glad everyone is safe and well. Um, I'm just going to read one poem. Uh, Tom, I know you know this one. Um, and I thought, you know, it's, it's in the wake of a lot of things that are happening, obviously, uh, this is a poem that sort of explains the way I view the world, and, and it gives me a sense of calm. So it's called As Light. At night, the old Russian farmer plows once more the row of barley before whispering good night, okone nochi, to the tomato plant tilting liltingly in the plot beside his cabin. And so it goes. This day dims its shining to a simmer that simmers again into the cool taste of dark. I am waiting to die every day. It's okay. You are too. When it comes, I will not be ready. I am learning instead a little bit better how to live. Come sunlight, the old Russian wakes and whispers good morning through the small crack of window. Dobre utro, he murmurs toward the plant, and the plant bows one near purple and bulbous tomato as if to greet him. It goes on like this, you know, the greeting and the singing, your lips Pressed against the cold, the finely tuned harp, the spider plays beneath the surface, the people, and how they came, and how you did not know what to say, you still don't. And so each morning you woke and spoke soft to the easy listener that is the wall, and you took photos of light, but did not know who to share them with. Never knew what to make of the way this, all of this, will go on without you if it comforts or if it harms. The old Russian farmer breaks for lunch and holds the strawberry in his mouth just a second longer each day. He holds it for hours now. A lunch spent marinating his tongue in fruit. He has earned this, but does not need to say this to himself, as you might, as I most surely would. He only sits in the high light of noon and makes a kind of wine out of the inside of his mouth and smiles, nods, becomes for a time as close to earth as God, 
which is to say, so close to earth, he transcends it and allows himself to remake the universe over and over again, all of creation, until the story goes, that the moon rises and he knows her name and says hello, and the tomato plant beside the cabin is the brother he lost in the war and each strawberry well, something about love, yes? Good morning. This day is a memory we journey through until we learn to call it home. In whatever language, however long it takes, the people are here and we will all go a little crazy. It happens. But this world is good to us. I nod to the sky and it responds with rain. I miss your kiss but find an old one you gave trapped on the inside of my eyelids. I close my eyes at night. And somehow, for no reason, all these pictures come to life. Sometimes they scare me. That's okay. I wake and everything is changed without my permission. How beautiful. Someone else call in all these shots. And then I bend my head to sides, confused at times by beauty. I once thought all good things must end. But this doesn't. It goes on and it goes on. And so I was wrong. Nothing dies. It comes back as the old farmer, the plants beside the cabin, the moon arcing at night between the rough map of the stars, the fruit held in the mouth, and yes, and yes, and yes, it comes back as light. Thank you. That, everyone, was Devin Kelly. And that poem, As Light, you can read at Redivider, and you can read a whole book of poems by Devin, which is a miracle. I still kind of countenance every day. In This Quiet Church of Night, I say amen from Civil Coping Mechanisms. And if you want to follow more of Devin's poetry or the videos that he's very carefully making for his high school students, you can follow him on Twitter at the money I O T H E M O N E Y I O W E. Thank you so much, Devin. Every time I hear that poem, I learn something new. Um, and I am so, 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 so excited to introduce the next, not just reader, but pair of readers. Um, one, the co-organizer of Performance Anxiety, Kristen Garth, and one frequent co-editor um, of Other Things with Kristen Garth uh, and runner of Ghost City Press, Justin Karcher. So I'm going to introduce them in turn, but they're actually going to read together. So I'm just going to read a couple of quick intros, and then they are going to take it away. So Kristen Garth is a pushcart, best of the net, and Riesling nominated sonnet stalker. Her sonnets have stocked journals like Glass, Yes, 521, Luna Luna, and more. She's the author of 15 books of poetry, including Pink Plastic House and Shut Your Eyes, Sucky Bye from Maverick Duck Press, Crow Carriage and Candy Cigarette Woman Child Noir, The Hedgehog Poetry Press, Flutter, Southern Gothic Fever Dream from Twisted Press, and The Meadow, which I had the privilege of reviewing from Apex Publications. She's the founder of Pink Plastic House, a tiny journal, and co-founder of Performance Anxiety, this very online poetry reading series. Um, and it's very hard to introduce quickly two very accomplished people because she's reading with just Justin Karcher, who's the best of a net, a best of the net and pushcart nominated poet and playwright born and raised in Buffalo, New York. He's the author of several books, including Tailgating at the Gates of Hell from Ghost City Press in 2015. He's also the editor of Ghost City Review and the co-editor of the anthology My Next Heart, New Buffalo Poetry from Blaze Vox Books in 2017. Thank you all both for reading on performance anxiety. I'm going to shut up now and you're going to read us some awesome poems. <laughs> All right, I'm starting out because we, um, Justin and I decided to do this little project because we both love the movie. And so he wanted me to write a poem first and then he would respond to it. And that sort of all happened in the process of the world falling apart. So you can sense that in, in the poems, <laughs> you'll, you'll see. But, um, I'll start with my first one and then he'll go and then I'll finish. If you men only knew how eyes wide shut, she waits for you, naked in narcissus, paper white, while you mass desire, hide in plain sight, seek strange sacred rituals of lust, uninvited, bask at what you must, risk life perchance to peer, an addicted girl will disappear, be fucked a dozen times by billionaires, while near a bevy beast tilt heads to stare. I'm plucked bare bloom who stretches at your bedroom toward sunlight, warmth, any touch you've ceased to look at very much. Aches to be consumed in ceremonies with an unmasked beast. 
You seek Wonderland, if you only knew how Alice, naked, full of holes, seeks you. What you seek is seeking you, Bernie thinks, as he walks the streets of America alone at night. Everyone behind closed doors wearing plague masks and watching the same news clips over and over again. An unemployed orgy of paranoid schizoids while billionaires are still fucking other billionaires in wilderness bunkers the size of basketball arenas. Social distancing does not apply to the ruling class. Bernie's eyes have never been shut, though. They have always been wide, like a fisherman's net, catching everything that crosses their path. The plight of the addicted girl, the plight of the disappearing boy, the plight of the working class, our autobiography, what it's like to desperately want a piano, but you can't afford it. So throughout your life, you've been collecting piano key after piano key in the hopes that one day your descendants will unite your broken parts and make beautiful music out of them. That hopefully those symphonies will free the boisterous bloom from your bleak bones, all the feelings you've bottled up all these years. Maybe then all this will seem worth it if real change happens, if all the secret societies fall in on themselves and there are no more conspiracies, if they only knew how much we're sweating on the inside. Maybe then will the struggles seem tolerable, that they were the spark that led to something better, how we persevered and took up arms against a bevy of beasts, how their music was just one long, jagged, repetitive sound that caused us to risk everything for revolution, impossible sex and what seemed like a bedroom of no possibilities. Bernie peering through our windows and watching us cry, then muttering an aphrodisiac prayer, and suddenly our teardrops have minds of their own, how they meet in the middle of all this emptiness and fuck one another so hard they turn into bullets, the staccato undone, they look for their guns. You wander into Denmark uninvited, enticed by naked sounds, my gated grounds. Aphrodisiac someone recited inside a piano bar, staccato sounds of penetration with a mask. If asked, one uttered word, Denmark becomes a key to verboten, velvet-cloaked sodomy. Backbent whores and antique tabletop orgies, a blinded man's prophecy, his proffer towards a rotten state made masquerade, where even a doctor is considered pauper, trespasser in a billionaire's gangbane charade. I am secretly maintained, manicured, you can violate me with a word. Thanks. <laughs> and that marvelous collaborative reading Thank you. is again brought to you by, <laughs> thank you so much, Justin and Kristen for that. Um, and you can find more of Justin's work, Justin the Middle Poet, uh, at Justin underscore Karcher on Twitter and on Instagram at the.man.about.town. Um, and Kristen, who is also the co-organizer of Performance Anxiety, you can find her on Twitter at L-O-L-A-A-N-D-J-O-L-I-E, Lola and Jolie, and on her website, Kristen Garth, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, Garth, G-A-R-T-H dot com. Um, so thank you all so much. We've never had a really, truly collaborative reading on uh, performance anxiety before, but I think if I'm right, we might be about to have two because our next reader, ZM Wise, might be sharing a collaborative piece with us if I remember our uh, conversation earlier this evening correctly. And ZM Wise is a proud Illinois native from Chicago, a poet, essayist, occasional playwright, seldom screenwriter, co-editor, and arts activist, writing since his first steps as a child. He's a co-owner and co-editor of Transcend Zero Press, an independent publishing house for poetry that produces an international quarterly journal known as Harbinger Asylum. He has five books of published poetry, including Take Me Back, Kingswood Clock, The Wandering Poet, 
Wolf and Epic and Other Poems, Cuentos de Amor, and Cosmish and the Horned Ones. His debut play, Bottles of Emerald and for the Demon Queen, um, and other than these books, his poems, lyrics, essays, and book reviews have been published in various journals, magazines, and anthologies. Besides poetry and other forms of writing, his other passions and interests include professional voice acting, singing, lyricism, and songwriting, playing a few instruments, fitness, and reading. ZM, thank you so much for being with us again tonight, and take it away. Although I'm not sure we can hear you at this moment. You want to test your sound real quick? Mm -mm. Any luck, CM? All right, so we can't hear ZM right at this moment, but we're going to try to work on that in the interim and see if we can do anything to uh, fix that situation. But if we can do that um, while we're doing that, I would love to skip really quickly as long as he's okay with it, question mark, to our fourth reader who might be okay with doing this, um, who's Joe Yanni. And Joe is a poet and performance artist from Toronto. Joe, are you okay stepping in? Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Joe, thank you so much. We're going to work that out in the details, but I cannot take away anything from the poems that Joe is going to read to us this evening because they're going to rock. So thanks, Joe. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, kind of in the spirit of, of tonight and getting this particular reading together, uh, I'm not a teacher myself, but there are a lot of teachers in my life who are being affected. Um, and the next three poems are all by uh, people who I consider uh, my teachers and just wonderful people in general. Um, this first poem is by uh, uh, Eugenia Zorowski. Uh It's called Inventory. In this room, there are five kinds of bone, not counting shells or husks or anything yet hung with flesh. There are three holes for fingers, not counting the sockets of the skull. This bone has blossomed into something else. No one knows what it wants. This one is a knife pointed north. Something has shed us, and in being cast off, we have become sacred and strange. Clusters of stone, a coiled spoon, debris gathered like salt in a jar, held in reserve for no purpose, for unseated weather. Um, the next one I want to share with you is by Hua Huen from her uh, book from Wave called uh, Violet Energy and Guts. It's the first from the book called Autumn 2012 Poem. Call capable a lemony light and fragile. Time like a ball and elastic. So I can stop burning the pots, wondering, yes, electric stove. She is her, but I don't re remember, remember the ashes I obsess, she said. I was obsessed with not wanting to work with ashes. Mandible dream, says the street and ash work because the scorn and ions long there. I work. I woke up in the overlooked dark. I work, do that warp, twistingly wrap the dead, black and white like the long dead, starved pet rodent eating the basement curtains and peanut shells. I walk. I walk. I walks down sometimes. Why the advice? Abide. The advice was not fare better, but fail better. Auto dish soap. Half and half. Coffee beans. Bake the golden things. Rust colors. Rust colors. 
Um, and this last one uh, is by um, the ever wonderful, uh, you know, poet who's taught me, I think, the most important lessons about poetry. Um, this is Mary Oliver from her book, Blue Horses. Um, this is uh, after reading Lucretius, I Go to the Pond. The slippery green frog that went to his death in the heron's pink throat was my small brother. And the heron with the white plumes like a crown on his head, who is washing now his great sword beak in the shining pond, is my tall, thin brother. My heart dresses in black and dances. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Joe, for these endlessly inventive and surprising lyrics that you've shared with us in performance anxiety. Um, and Joe, again, is a as a poet and performance artist from Toronto. And if you want to find more of Joe's work, uh, I love the poems that he posts and shares with us frequently. Um, you can find him at WTF is a poet on both Twitter and Instagram. Um, so we're going to give it a shot. Let's see if we can get back to ZM, who again has two books forthcoming. One, The Bottles of Emerald for the Demon Queen, which is his debut play, uh, and also his latest poetry collection, Illinois and Finitarium, will be published by Cherry House Press in the coming months. So ZM, can we hear you okay? Let's give it one can, more shot. Uh, can, can you hear me? Can anyone yes. hear me? Fantastic. Oh my goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Yes, success. It's alive. Okay. Cool. Fire away. Thank you so much for your patience, <laughs> and I can't wait to hear this work. Thank you very much for your patience, as as uh, as doctors would say. Uh -huh. No, but seriously. Um, Yes, good evening to all crisis companions and pandemic pals. Um, I have a, uh, a few pieces, two by me. I'm sorry, two not by me, and one by me. This first one I cannot, uh, this this poet I cannot promote enough. After I read her book, I, I kid you not when I say I had to put it down to breathe, weep a little, and just ponder for the longest time. It's none other than Safia Sinclair. You might have seen me promote her book, Cannibal, on Twitter uh, a time or two. And this is my favorite piece from that book. It's called Portrait of Eve as the Anaconda. <clears throat> I, too, am gathering the vulgarity of botany, the eye and its nuclei for mischief. Of man redacted I came, am coming, fasting, starving carved, myself a selfish idol, its shell unsuitable. I, twice discarded, arrived thorn-side and soon outgrew his reptilian sheen. A fine specimen, let me have it, something inviolate, Splayed in bird lime, legs and exposed anemone, against jailbait August, its x-ray sky, this light a gorgon slick, polygamous doom, and God again calling much too late, who aches to stick an ache in my unmentionable. His primal plant remains elusive, wildfire and pathogen, blood knot of human fleshed there in his beard, how I am hot for it. Call me murderous, a glowing engine, time to blow. Watch it go with unjealousy, shadow. Let me have it, this maidenhead primeval. Schemes, what ovule of cruel invention, the Venus trap, the menses. And how many ways to announce this guilt, whore's nest of ague. Supernova, wild stigmata, womb. I boast a vogue sacro sanctum, engorging short pornographies, the cell's unruly strain, rogue empire multiplying for thousand virile thousand years, my wings pinned wide in parthenogenesis, such miraculous display. So that was Sophia Sinclair. Hopefully she won't mind me reading her piece. This uh, next person... Um, Usually when I, before I read my piece, I usually try to pay some sort of tribute to either the living or the deceased or both. If it wasn't for them, whether ancient or contemporary, we wouldn't be here. And <laughs> this is going to be a tad different, and um, I'll tell you who it's by at the end. But the piece is called Northern Sky, and 
here's hoping I don't blow out your eardrums. <clears throat> I never felt magic crazy as this. I never saw moons, knew the meaning of the sea. I never held the motion in the palm of my hand. I felt sweet breezes on the top of a tree. But now you're here, right in my northern sky. Been a long time that I'm waiting. Been a long time that I'm blown. Been a long time that I've wandered through the people I have known. Oh, if you would and you could straighten my new mind's eye. Would you love me for my money? Would you love me for my head? Would you love me through the winter? Would you love me till I'm dead? Oh, if you would and you could Come blow your horn on high I never felt magic crazy as this I never saw moons, knew the meaning of the sea I never held emotion in the palm of my hand I felt sweet breezes in the top of a tree But now you're here Bright in my northern sky. All right, that was by Nick Drake, this artist among others like Ian Curtis, Sid Barrett, Daniel Johnston, people along those lines who, with mental illness. They've come to mean a lot to me. And uh, that's my mother's favorite <laughs> Nick, Nick Drake song. So um, right now I'm going to uh, uh, read a piece Um uh, that I wrote a few years ago. It's an argumentative dialogue piece, and I'm going to read it with none other than my father, Roger, and it's called Walking Hypotheses Between an Aristocrat and a Bohemian. He will be playing the aristocrat. I'll be playing the bohemian. He'll be speaking a little more sternly, and I'm going to sound like I'm from the summer of love. So, so Walking Hypotheses Between an Aristocrat and a Bohemian, previously published in Ganasco Literary Journal. Oh, wealth is the basis of all personal game. Security and stability come in as income, swimming in a stockpile, from the one that raised salaries and questions. And through the pain of pain, it wanes on in the never-ending monopoly game. Money, the finest hour of power. This hand, by this hand, the bountiful land we live off of, the hand fits on the land as an organic glove wearer and cloth bearer. This community, by this community, the workers are dedicated in daylight and dance around the moon's white heat and composition tonight. While the strains of the rain remain in plain sight, towers on the rise with structured organization harvesting the boss person's organ to the glossy bossa nova beat. Glam wears the outside in. Play that mediocre music average. Beige boy on thin ice, your eyes are on the teenage crushed diamond. Suppose the crops rot like abuse violence victims in driftwood caskets, affording to only be buried three feet under. The eulogizing will carry on, stoned heads with inscriptions, so sick of the nicotine-stained, plastic-clubbed-out femme fatales, they have strayed from the lifestyle of giving birth to a breath more important than they are. Swim under the thousands of leagues of reassurance in print, bank with the Super Bowl, eating away and bouncing back, tireless efforts and effortless, effortless tires, Reruns of promotional moments out to represent royalty, earned through humanistic tenacity, not inherited through father's phallus. We, the modernists, say nothing. We, the workhorses, light bottom fires under pressure, not from peers, but you. There is no fourth wall to break. You are already processing looks of deception. Break away from possessions. There is only one self. There is indecisive progression. 
heard the news today, junior citizen? Seen the newsprint? Hell's frozen icicles have penetrated warm bodies and dropped the stocks off of jagged rocks, bottomed cliffs. Feel the innuendo of hollering dollars. The censored image carries roaring twenties, stacks in her undergarments. The iced earth took a volcanic turn. Every wave that crashes upon this shore adds one more reason to wear this well-dressed laurel, for we will keep following the footsteps of the dead. They write in symbolic hieroglyphs, metered verse free-flowing from the spoken tongue, spooned and not forked, cryptic in society, but mastered by orators on the page. Thank you all, and the special mentions to my grandfather, my father, Professor Joel Smith, and Miss Thompson for influ influencing my writing and works in the arts all around. Sorry I took so long. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Of course, that was, uh, I think, two performance anxiety firsts from ZMYs. Uh, one poem with poem with dad and also poem uh, sung, which is, you know, a really, really great privilege on our part. So again, if you want to find more of ZM's work, including more info about his two forthcoming books, you can find stuff on his website at uh, zmwise.wixsite.com slash zmwisethepoet, or you can follow him on Twitter at zmwisepoet uh, in you know, that was that was awesome. I, I think performance anxiety is richer for having had that happen on live and on air. Um, and we're really excited. It's really great to invite returners to performance anxiety. And uh, Amy Alexander is just such a returner. Amy Alexander is a Ruth Lilly Fellowship finalist and AWP Intro Journals winner. Her book, The Legend of the Kettle Daughter, came out in 2019. She's also an illustrator and currently at work on the illustration for our very own Kristen Garth's Crow Carriage. So thank you so much, Amy, for being being here with us on a parent-teacher conference night and take it away. Thank you. It's so good to see everybody. I've been kind of isolated with my family, so it's really good to see other people who I'm not genetically related to. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the first two poems I'm going to read are from my forthcoming book from Hedgehog Poetry um, called The Parcel Child Song, and it's, it's a story about friendship and um, these two poems uh, sort start out with a specific person. The first poem is kind of describes a specific person's bedroom. And then the second poem is kind of bookending that section. And it kind of shows the way that we carry our friendships from being uh, with specific people until we take on the qualities of those people that we admire and help them to live forever. So this is called Bedroom of Toys. In Parcel Child's Bedroom of Toys, the R2-D2s and the nameless droids meet fangs and green minds, feral underbites, looking glass eyes, trilobites, zombie movies painted, cadmium on crimson, Stan Lee's grin. Mammoths free themselves from the tar pits in La Brea, a thousand miles away. On the top shelf close to crows and G.I. Joe dolls, Iron weaponry longs to go home, leap out the window, meet the ore their mothers put there, the parts their mothers' mothers unleashed in the first fire and pulled up to wear, as if to say, I am not here for you to look at, but to make you see. And this poem is called, Who Will Stitch Our Story? The glaciated language under our feet is longing. Where is the woman who will stitch our story? The men tunnel fast to find their way. Parcel child takes the gradual canyon rim with its sun cloak and murmuring migrating animals. She is the daughter and the mother piecing battle waste, broken waste, blue gray blood pelts stabbed slender for shoulders. Milk dropped from udders, the mewling and mewling of this other tongue. It takes time to pull the scraps together, more than we have. So the needle passes from her to me, me to you, push the thread down the cut, pull it up through the earth. And this last poem I wrote for um, the workshop that Kristen put up um, on Pink Plastic House. Uh, she put a picture of a, a photograph with a lot of 
images in it, items that she pulled from her doll collection, and challenged uh, the, her viewers to incorporate 10 of the images into that, into their poem. So this is also a sonnet in tribute to her, not that I could ever be as good. So <laughs> anyway, this is called Inevitable Epitaphs. Beneath the glass, a pretty cake we asked the bakery girl to label it in red. Swinging, swallowed, door closed, she was, was she masked enough? Microscopic droplets of dread are weighed against the sloppy, loosely gloved. But the icing was pearled, and that little girl you once were ignites like x-ray. You loved a Barbie hot birthday I couldn't get for you. Purple ballerinas put away for headphones now. Soap opera sex. Billy's tarantula. Drive home, steady the box. Math is how you decide we are safe. Bye, Corona. Your message written on a cake for laughs. Smarts like inevitable epitaphs. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you so much, Amy, and uh, thank you for sharing that kind of slice of life from our, our here and now. Uh, and that was really cool. And you can uh, find more of Amy's work on Twitter at I R I E M O M, Irie Mom, and on Instagram at Amy with a pen. Uh, and Amy would also like to shout out her kids, Ryan and Charlotte, who are handling all of their school requirements during this quarantine without any of her input. Truly a feat in this COVIDian time. Um, so thank you so much, Amy. And we're going to move thank on you. to our second half of our reading order. Thank you. Um, with Andrew Silvesi, who uh, I'm happy to introduce. And I'm very happy to uh, hear new poems from Andrew because uh, Andrew teaches British literature outside of Boston and has poems appearing or forthcoming in Cutbank, Smartish Pace, Barrow Street, Tar River Poetry, the American Journal of Poetry, and Rhino, among others. He lives in Boston, stone's throw from where I am, uh, with his wife. So Andrew, thanks so much for being here. And I'm really excited to hear your poems. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> so uh, the first one I have is really short. It's part of a sequence of very short poems I wrote about six years ago, but it feels really relevant for today. Uh, it's just called The Sphere is Cracked. The sphere is cracked, mere eye contact. You brood about the sky. Everything is far more brittle than you thought it'd be. The next three are a little cheerier. Um, in some ways, they're... Um, they're thinking about teaching in different ways. The first one's called Snow Day with Oranges. I learn about the energy market to win an internet argument with a user named Fartman69. I lose. I play Risk online with friends. One makes the Princess Bride joke, and I don't laugh because in this game, they're all land wars. I lose. I print scholarly articles that I won't read. I watch the last three minutes of a Yukon game on YouTube. They lose. I sit and try to sketch the trees in my backyard, but instead I imagine the Arch of Constantine. In front is a ring of fire, out of which a white tiger leaps at Mickey Mouse. I am riding that tiger, though I look different astride him, big muscles and flowing hair like He-Man, and I carry the power sword in one hand and a copy of Keats's poem in the other. I make lunch. I eat oranges. I become obsessed with finding beautiful pictures of the dead. I fall in love first with Maud Feely, then Helene and a held, then an unnamed Creole woman posed like the Fayum mummy portrait. And then I fall in love with the mummy portrait with, a, with one of the mummy portraits backed by gold. I imagine I've stolen the DeLorean to go back and meet her. Her name is Berenice and I think of Callimachus. I can use this device to visit him and bring back some lost works. Part of me thinks I'd make money like Biff, but no one cares about Callimachus anymore. And without gas, the DeLorean is as useless as a rotten orange. I bet I'm the next emperor and win big. I avoid Pompeii. I make up stories about the future. There are flying cars, I tell her. I explain a car. I participate in the lioness and the cheese grater. I watch our children play among the reeds and tell them that Cleopatra is closer to us in time than she is to the pyramids. They are unimpressed. I make a Prince Albert in a can joke. Nobody laughs. 
I feel at home for the first time in years. I age and watch my children become merchants. It is wonderful to watch them fall in love. One daughter-in-law worked in a pub. Their beer is bad, sour, yeasty, and flat. I drink it. I am convinced that I am my own ancestor. Uh, this next one is, uh, is called outcropping um, after a day I did a lot of dishes. Outcropping. The shale-hued baking pan, shorn of broccoli, wedged upwards, hides today's archaeology with almost geologic accuracy. Yes, only a few utensils have slipped to the bottom. Rabbits in the sinks Precambrian to fool some modern Haldane into faith. The mess isn't beautiful, but that it stands astounds. And as if there was design behind this Le Chevier, I hesitate to touch. I don't use gloves. Limousine liberal that I am, I have organic dish soap, citrus scented and refreshing to nose and hand. Just below the Holocene are bits of crust from a ham sandwich and splashes of mustard. I can recreate the lunch from evidence, except the cup is upside down, the liquid lost. Finally, I lift the plate, flip it and rinse it, and gently place the artifact with the others in the drying rack. The steak knives are last, frayed bits of sacrifice still in their teeth. Done, I see a perfect emptiness, a whole history erased from the basin. Though thirsty, I refuse a glass of water. I don't even pour my beer out of the can. And the last one is sort of an homage to, uh, to summer break that we may or may not have. Uh, July 4th at the Beach House. Summer's not yet conquered the sound, but that will be its final act, worm waters charged with winter's blazon. Although the beachfront looks the same as years ago, developers have hopscotched all along the shore, where once the elderly rolled their eyes at our seaside frisbee, beanbag, and beer, now households of college kids ignore us. Z's brought some beer back from Amsterdam. I hear about his trip. Brett's back from Cuba and has a box of Goibas. We think our parties might be calmer, full of grown-up conversations about, say, gardens, books, cuisine. Cracking beer and lighting cigars, we do find the discussing discussion verging on the serious, though unpleasant. A dad developing dementia, two moms widowed, a brother in a loveless marriage, a dead dog, too. And then, goddamn the politics, and this we're all of one mind, depressed. The sunset seems to mean so much. Of course, that's mostly due to swigging beers and smoking much too fast. We have to hurry to the show. As we get there, everywhere is a blur. The fireworks burst brilliant along the strand. The ocean shines obsidian. Smoke and joyful shouts, ash burning my cheek. The sky leans down through haze like a mother to embrace me. It whispers, what? I don't know. I never hear these things. But let's pretend it said, be here, with flashing lights and waves that seem to have traveled from the stars to crash. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing those poems with us. And again, if you would like to find more of Andrew Silvesi's work, you can find him on Twitter at A-N-D-R-E-W-S-Z-I-L-V-A-S-Y. Um, and we're going to keep the Boston motif running uh, by introducing another poet who uh, I was lucky to meet uh, by chance in front of our very own Cambridge Grolier Poetry uh, Bookshop some years ago, uh, Owen Gray. And Owen Gray is an English teacher and poet. He's a member of the Pow Wow River Poets, along with, I think, Andrew, if I'm not misspeaking. Uh, and in the summers, you can, you can often find him on Wednesday nights at the Boston Poetry Slam at the Cantab Lounge. Thanks so much for being here, Owen. I'm really excited to hear your work. Thank you, Tom, for having me. I have three poems tonight. Uh, the first is called Fever Dreams. One, the bones are spread out on the table. She sits, waiting, staring, hoping. She says, but I don't understand. Your future is written right there. It's not my fault if you never learn to read. The crone laughs. Her gray-green skin convulses as she draws each new breath. Now for my payment, your heart. The crone grabs her dull knife. Don't fret, Baba Yiga knows best. Two, she is soaked through. 
she cannot see but must keep moving forward. She can almost make out patterns in the fog, faces she can't quite make out. Tendrils caress her cheek, her hair, try to take her hand, slide up her thigh, grab her. Stay. Stay with us. Yes, we love you. Two steps back for each one forward. She fears she won't reach the lighthouse. Three. You have been gone for so, so long. You kissed my forehead when I was ill for the first time and held me. Now you're coming back for me? Why now? All the other times I've called on you, you played deaf. What is special about this time? Have you not liked the names I've called you before? I see. It's my time. I'm glad you kindly stopped for me. Four. She reaches up to touch his cheek. He places his hand atop hers. The fire coolly consumes him. His hair becomes a comet's tail. She watches as his eyes boil. His true essence reveals itself. His char-black skull's vacant gaze shows more tenderness than his eyes ever did. You've never been more beautiful, she says, as she draws him nearer. Uh, my next poem is called Hades Creek, and it's a retelling of the Orpheus myth. There was a time he only wrote for her. She was the reason for his songs, and they were happy for a while. Then she encouraged him to share his art, and he began to sing their love at shows. She felt a little selfish pride that she could have what others wanted so. But soon he spent such time away from her that she began to feel alone. His songs, their house, their wealth were not enough. She loved the man, of that she had no doubt, and they had been happy once, she thought. Her aunt had said, you cannot trust an artist to stay faithful to his wife. Her words rang true, a prophecy. Soon jealousies would crowd out all her love, a nest of vipers living near her heart. And soon she gave in to despair. She moved her things into the basement rooms while he was out on tour with brand new songs he called The Weeping of the Trees. The house felt like a tomb when he came back, and he did not expect to find this dog with eyes like flashing fire there. Each night he sent her messages and prayed his songs were strong enough to see him through the restless days and sleepless nights. In time, he put the guardian dog at ease and made his way into this other world, or so it felt to him that night. He waited there for her to notice him. He was alone with her, no songs to help, only the echoes of his breath. And she no longer seemed to be the woman who had once echoed through his songs, some other woman in her place, as if the woman he had known so long, uncertain yet infinitely patient, had been replaced with someone else. Then finally she spoke. She welcomed him like some guest. He sat with her, they laughed. She said she thought that she could try. He offered her his hand, but she wavered then. You, you go ahead, she said. I'll follow you. With greedy steps, he made his way, but heard the echoing of only his steps. Atop the stairs, he looked back for her and saw that she was gone for good. Um, and my last poem I wrote around the time that uh, our current president was inaugurated. It's called The Coming Fires. My grandfather sat looking at the embers that had calmed down and begun to die. He looked so far away, remote, almost a picture in some forgotten history book. He sighed and spoke, now do not wish to live through interesting times, my boy. You want, listen here, peace. It won't be much to write about, the world needs fewer poets anyhow. He left me then, uncertain and alone. I stared at the piled up ashes and the soot. I tried to picture what had come before. The forests, then loggers, then roaring flames. I've not forget forgotten, though all that was long ago, as around the world, new logs are being piled up. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Owen, for sharing that with us. And if you'd like to find more of Owen's work, you can find more about Owen and the other Pow Wow River Poets at uh, Pow Wow River Poets, P-O-W-O-W, riverpoets.com. And Owen's page is uh, powwowriverpoets.com slash Owen dash gray. Um, so moving into our last group of three readers this evening, um, Eric Fuhrer is next. And Eric is the author of four books, including Not Human Enough for the Census, published by Vegetarian Alcoholic Press, a really great imprint. Uh, at the end of this year, Spoit and Doivel Press will be publishing Eric's next book, In Which I Take Myself Hostage. So thank you again, Eric, for being with us tonight. And uh, I'm really excited to hear this work. Although I think I might have you muted at this point. My bad. And can you hear us okay? Yeah. Can you hear All me? Right, fantastic. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Take it away. All right. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read um, three poems, uh, and they're all relatively new, probably in the last month or so. Uh, so the first poem is called Stiletto Heel Sermon. We arrive late at the chapel, our eyes the color of our heels, after walking the world over, searching for the glass slipper that would slide over our own toes like communion. The preacher feeds us tarantulas on sourdough, and we remember how it feels to be blessed. So we sequin our tongues to one another and feel the Holy Ghost rush between the warmth breath of our intimacy before clasping hands in the chapel's glass eye. The world is sliding its back towards Bethlehem and we are the rough beast and the falcon is the reason we are all still blinking. So the preacher says, let's tap dance to the Lord with our teeth and everyone flaps their eyes like windows and we all stick our stiletto heels into each other's mouths like guns. Snail shell safety. My eyelids are the newspapers I read when the light hurts too much to leave the snail shell curling me into the safety of a lover. I have tattooed miracles onto my body in hope that if you ever find me, you can Jesus me back into the world like a pig falling over a mountain. Shh. Just a second ago, the bread was falling and you were wearing glass sandals with heels like the devil's backbone, and I was a python waiting for a slice of apple from your holy lips. My body is the scent of your rejection, that you towel off with my willow tree hair, and you are the opal candle that waxed its way into the shape of my bedazzled mind, and I am the disco ball your platform shoes always dreamed of, and I am your own private piano, and you are fumbling through the next sonata with enough cocaine in your nostrils to keep us awake through this plague. And the last one is called Former Meat. Our water lily faces flood our burlap hearts with enough bees to brittle the yawp of a ship of Vikings. Our ship is a mouth of bruises that we tenderize with baptismal feet straight from the river of our indiscretions. We are the chains of teeth spiking the temples with our blood turned dirt, turned fish in the sunlight and the flip flop pulse. To, to lick up the egg of the dawn is a pocket of pleasure ephemeral in the world's egg boiled soft. We are salt scattered from a pillar, shut eye glancing back with a small peak at our former meat quietly sailing off. Thank you.
Wow, Eric, thank you so much for those primordial, incredible pieces of work. Uh, and that again was Eric Fuhrer, who you can find on Twitter at E R I K F U H R E R, at Eric Fuhrer. And uh, you can also find his work at his website, eric Fuhrer.com. Uh, and his wife, Kim, provided full color artwork for Not Human Enough for the Census, which is the his book from Vegetarian Alcoholic Press. And her prints can be found for sale under the Art by Kim tab on the Eric Fuhrer.com website. Kim's also going to be providing art for his next book from Swoyt and Doyle Press. Um, so we are nearing the end of our reading order. Two more readers to go. And the next reader I'm excited to introduce is Jack Brendan Miller. Uh, Jack Brendan Miller is a poet and essayist from San Francisco. His work has appeared in Dove Coat, uh, lovingly edited by several people, including Danielle Rose, who I, who I care for greatly, and Ghost City Review, edited by our very own Justin Karcher, who you heard earlier. Also Tram Set. Most recently, most recently. So thank you, Jack. Appreciate having you on and take it away. Hi, guys. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me just pull up uh, the poem on my Google Docs. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, this poem is called To My Father, um, based off of um, Ocean Vuong's poem, To My Father, uh, To My Unborn Son. So, uh, to my father, our little blue house is silhouetted and then traced into the changing seasons. The reasons are difficult with our madness. The first life with you I can remember, the pale blue paint chipping off the side of the house filled with living. See now that as sunset, sunsets immolate into a consuming red in all the places where we have lived, See that as you may burn into gorgeous colors taken to the night, I may leave something behind. Your fingers and a rusted wedding finger feel familiar to me. The swirling touch you comforted a child bowing to what you may reason. After the burning of the crawl space, in between your bare hope and your clinging to the light faded side of home, your closed fist for prizes resists attack to try to leave something behind. Something that moves through the seasons, it wards off the violence of love. Try not to picture it. Yes, you have grown it into a stilted photograph, one that we didn't smack off the walls to shatter, I promise it. Someday, they will find it, turning over stones in the woods, standing in stillness together, seeing. Once, I was a father. When through speeding shouts, I was sure you were going to drive us into the river. Our cigarettes set the car on fire while we plunged. I imagined that everything was in changing, and in that ending, I left behind children. Poems scattered on the highway, and I tended them, and I loved them, and I forgave you. Because what you thought you had is true. We are bare, and we are this side of home where life may have grown, and the reasons are so difficult to come by. I watched you burn it back. Do you see me now? The waters have calmed because our blue house leans into a howling and I will know when there is nothing left. If you are given a chance, give it away. If you are given change, be sure to gaze down at it and weep. Leave no traces while you burn. See that I never chose that house, which way the shelter goes up in flames. See that my voice is always abating below you and you are every color in a flame. Now can you see the dark mapping out my future children and the shifting apart from you. This means we are kindling and my voice is tied in you. This means you are not wounded and you will not wound. If you pray in this forming dark, do it incessantly. If you can still picture me, you are not clinging to it enough. Pray for the first signs of winter and if you are given change, you will find all the tragic colors of a flame on a blanket of snow. There are faces of children that melt there in your gorgeous light. Cling to them. Thank you. Wow, Jack, thank you for that poem so filled with fire and and really warming in its way on um, a night where we could probably use it. Um, and again, that was Jack Brendan Miller, who you can find on Twitter at Jack B. Miller, J-A-C-K-B-M-I-L-L-E-R. And uh, Jack's debut collection, Glory Tree Ghost, comes out soon from 
bone and ink press. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it's with a little bit of chagrin that I move to our last reader, who I'm happy to introduce. Uh, sometimes Joe is alone uh, representing Toronto, but he is not tonight because Kate Felix is a writer and filmmaker from Toronto. Her work can be found in Cream City Review, Room Magazine, and Into the Void, among others. She is also, and I cannot stress this enough in a time like ours, a frontline healthcare worker and scared shitless right now. Thank you, Kate, for being here and for all you do. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? No? Okay. All right, we can hear you. You're good. You can hear me now? Perfect. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Awesome. So I'm just going to read some of my more funny ones because I honestly can't handle any of my serious ones right now and just kind of need to have a laugh. So the first one is called Chicken Lady in Repose. And it's about a gross lover. You consume your spicy poultry in the bed made crisp, leaving faint impressions of your crimson fingers on the combed white cotton and the lingering scent of cooked flesh in the electric air. You are a cunning criminal. I sleuth before the bedroom mirror, squeeze handfuls of errant tissue between my pristine palms. Divots reveal themselves, the leavings of a targeted gunfire upon my thickened thighs. But you are unmoved by this apparent cellulite massacre. Your shiftless molars crack a femur between them and you suck the hollow core free of its marrow. You can't even tell, babe, you say, because of all of your psoriasis. You ignore my aghast breath as you graze our near virgin sheets with the moist edge of your staining hand and wink at my reflection. And my mind is at once quieted and terrified by your unfettered honesty. You who are so beautiful and deliciously unaware of the ways in which your own connective tissues have failed you. My incisors ache to penetrate the slick expanse of your arm as you choose the next treat from your filthy bucket. And when your gaze returns to the mirror, the only thing that remains is the image of your sloppy, perfect lust. Um, the next poem is called In Defense of a Pseudonym. Being as I am so acutely aware of the persistent quality of your mother's breath and also her enduring love for literary critique, how else dare I describe the succulent feel of your nipples as they graze my thighs or the way your voice crackles in the instant before, well, that, or the swell of my lips, but not those ones, you know, the other ones, or how that old lady in line at the library leaned in close to your tongue, inhaled and asked if you had eaten onions for lunch, and you told her you had, even though you had not. And the last one is about crappy exes who refuse to leave. And it's called, Shall I Compare Thee to a Trash Panda? In midnight dives, you stalk your sloppy seconds. Tooth and claw, you pry wide. My defenses slide your eyes beneath the bones of dinners unconsumed. Feast on heaps of tissues with and the salt of my sighs. I rise to bemoan the cracks of simmering street brimming high with my perfectly packaged trash. Now disemboweled strewn awry on the drive as the sky cackles scorches while you snore, sated in some filthy den, grinding your incisors, masticating, anticipating the complicit moon and how it will shine on your nigh triumph. Thank you. 
Oh, that was wonderful. I wish I wish everyone had been unmuted for the like riotous laughs that greeted the title of that last poem. And I think I speak for all of our readers and listeners here thanking you, Kate, for the work that you're doing right now. And if you want to support Kate's writing and find out more about her work, you can find her on Twitter at Kitty underscore Flash, K-I-T-T-Y underscore F-L-A-S-H. And uh, Kate also just won the Pulp Literature Bumblebee Flash Fiction Prize, which is really awesome news uh, in time that's not totally populated by same. So um, if you want to find out more about Kate's work, you can also find her on her website uh, at www.katefelix, K-A-T-E-F-E-L-I-X.com. Uh, so as we come to the end of our parent-teacher conference-themed performance anxiety event, I'd like to thank all of our readers for making the time to read with us this evening. Uh, performance anxiety is rarely all live, and even though many of us have new schedules in quarantine, the healthcare workers like Kate, the parents whose children are suddenly home from school indefinitely, the teachers uh, scrambling to adjust their instruction to be online only or whatever their district is saying or state is saying, uh, they know full well that this does not always mean more free time. So we're really intensely grateful grateful to our readers and listeners for being with us in these trying times. And we hope you'll be able to join us again for our next reading, which will be next week, next Thursday, April 2nd. Um, next week's reading will be Performance Anxiety Social Edition with a little bit of time for discussion and feedback between readers, which ought to be really interesting. So even if you just want to join to talk about some poems, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you. Uh, in the spirit of parents and teachers in particular, uh, I'm going to close tonight's reading with a quick reading of a poem that I really love, a new one is Ish, I think, by Louise Gluck, and it's called Image. Try to think, said the teacher, of an image from your childhood. Spoon, said one boy. Ah, said the teacher, this is not an image. It is, said the boy. See, I hold it in my hand, and on the convex side a room appears, but distorted, the middle taking longer to see than the two ends. Yes, said the teacher, that is so, but in the larger sense, it is not so. If you move your hand even an inch, it is not so. You weren't there, said the boy. You don't know how we set the table. That is true, said the teacher. I know nothing of your childhood, but if you add your mother to the distorted furniture, you will have an image. Will it be good, said the boy? A strong image? Very strong, said the teacher. Very strong and full of foreboding.